Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. And welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners that you can find this episode on all three seasons on all the major audio platforms. And if you tune in via YouTube, don't be cheeky. Remember to click subscribe, leave a comment, like this video. Today's guest is someone very exciting. He's joining us from Pakistan on his first UK tour. He's a motivational speaker, a life coach, a da'i, and he has a massive growing online in terms of his podcast and his YouTube channel. There's a lot more that can be said about him in terms of his accolades, and that's none other than our dear brother, Sahil Adim. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sahil, how are you? I'm great, and uh, how are you doing? I'm, I'm awesome. good. I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Alhamdulillah, this is this year, me too. <laughs> Quite, I'm actually kind of jittery. <laughs> Don't be jittery. I, but I, I, bought, I rarely buy new clothes for guests. This okay. was a new t shirt. Was it not Jamal? Yeah, it is. I, I cut <laughs> in every, I didn't even iron it. Straight for Sahil Bai. <laughs> awesome, Alhamdulillah. Because the believers are a mirror of one another. Oh, mashallah. That's why I'm, you know, I'm against this word motivational speaker. You know, back home where I come from, actually, not just there. It started from America and all of that. This, this craze about motivational speaking. This is one of those things that I'm actually, you know, trying to stop. Why is it associated with you then? Because whoever is holding the mic and with a bit of a you know mix of English and Urdu, they call motivational speakers in Pakistan. Do you motivate the Muslims? <laughs> actually, at the condition that we are in right now, I'm yeah. actually trying to demotivate them out of the situation that they're actually so happy to be in. Oh, you know, same trying to, yeah. So more of a you know, I'm, I'm actually reversing the whole life cycle. Let me kick off today's podcast by a few warm up questions. They're called, oh, sure, sure. called quick fire. Uh -huh. And the reason why they're quick fire is because I intentionally would like you to keep the answers brief and I want the responses to be instinctive. Ooh, okay. So I'm going to mention some celebrated figures from the <coughs> India subcontinent and I want you to tell me your instinctive feelings or thoughts of them. Okay. Dr. Israr Ahmed. Oh, love. Alama Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, Light, literal, like the torch. Abu Al Maududi. Oh my God! Uh, inspiration. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Um, father. General Zia. Puppet. Tahrik Lay Labek Pakistan. I okay. I cannot quick fire this one because I'm still reading up to it. Because you know, recently I was asked this question. I didn't even know much about this. So what's the instincts? Instinct. Uh, good lads don't know much about them. PTI. Okay, with the TLP because these are this is democracy we're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm totally an anti-democracy guy. Anti I think that's going to be the bigger part of our discussion today. Yeah, absolutely you know? is. So where does PTI fit into that? Because PTI- I th I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, instinctively, I like PTI in, in, in a way that they've made the bigger change in the kind of people that, in the kind of age group that I want the change to happen. So they broke the, the idols. So, so there is some room or space for democracy then? No. But they used that system to yeah. make those changes. No, right? exactly. If, because of this system, that change could not have, cannot happen. And even if, they are together if any other system was you know herding them into a you know a group or or a direction it would have been was awesome jamaat islam again if uh, democracy was not there this is the only real uh, set of people with uh, enough academic and intellectual vigor but democracy is ruining them as well jamiat ulama islam f I think that's Fazlur Rahman's gang, I think. Yeah, no, I know who they are. I know, I just don't know why, why they're there. See, you now, these, these, all of these people are um, well intended. I'm just thinking they're inside a bigger confusion bubble, bubble of confusion, which is called democracy. And we've been sold this as, you know, one of the solutions. So let's look at one other group outside of that bubble. Uh, the Taliban in Pakistan, not the IEA, the Taliban in Pakistan. Yeah, I think they're they're created by some some in 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 you know internal Pakistani 
political force because they don't really represent anything that that uh, and I speak to the Taliban you know, this TTP thing it's not it's not real it's a it's more of a political pawn in the local Pakistani game it's not it's not even close to a religious uh, direct uh, well movement mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's not I said no so all of this nicely leads me to the very first question to open today's podcast and mm-hmm. that is Pakistan ke matlab kya yeah Pakistan ka matlab now alhamdulillah is la ilaha illallah it's, it's been a it's been a while since you know this turnaround has happened now it's happening alhamdulillah you sound very optimistic I am because uh, I see I see the landscape with uh, the kind of lens that I wear I see behavioral patterns I see I see consistency. I see I see celebrities which were never even they were never going to exist in the last generation. I'm not talking about far 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 away in the past. Mm-hmm. In the last generation wouldn't even look at a minute of the kind of people that kids are reading, you know, books and volumes of content that's been consumed from names that you mentioned Dr. Sir is one of them. Mm-hmm. He's the one who set the, you know, Modudi is the guy who actually, you know, it's, it's, I think it's uh, if if I had to mention someone other than Jinawari Bal sure. Sure. He, he would be Modudi. Really? He's the guy. Who, yeah, yeah, he's raising the he has raised the <clears throat> IQ of the whole generation like literally by by 10 20 points. And I'm not just talking about any IQ, of, you know, general skill, life skill. I'm talking about Islam. He he's he's given that kind of sense that that you know, regular Joes uh in universities with uh who cannot really, you know, understand the bigger political system can still make sense of an islamic solution inside pakistan this is i am um, may allah have you know rahman on him and I mean, may allah raise his ranks in jannah inshallah I mean, this, this guy is this this is the guy so what would, what would your response be to the f- the fact i would say that there is still a strong minority at least amongst the ruling elite which are very se- secular uh vehemently uh pro-western um Are you telling me that does not exist in higher education uh, institutions in Pakistan? No, I have a different take with this. Let me tell you what's going on. Uh, in Pakistan or in the classical Muslim mindset right now, majority of the Ahl Sunnah. The doctrine itself which was given to Muslims as in the name of Islam is secular. Any guy who you ever going to meet is going to be secular in the name of Islam if he's a Muslim. These guys who don't really understand Islam that well were trained from the West or wherever they got, they got it from, mm-hmm. which you're talking about the, the, you know, the elite of politics. The fact that Muslim with the beard, with the Quran in his hand, with enough knowledge, is using that knowledge to stay away from politics is the, the, you know, the bigger problem. And they're getting this from, you know, literally with the Bible. This is Matthew 22 they're actually using. Render to Caesar what belongs yeah, to Caesar. Otherwise, Muslims should have been taken in. But this is why Modudi. Why do you think I like Modudi so much? I'm putting Modudi in, you know, on the pedestal of Jinnah when it comes out to Pakistan. Because um, um, he's the only guy who rationalized the use of, or, you know, he put the word dominance inside the mind of a Muslim, that we have to dominate and create and control the system, even though I don't really agree to it, you know, the technique he used, democracy, of course. But um, he did what he, you know, whatever, the kind of chessboard he had, he played whatever he, he could with the kind of pieces he had on the board. Uh, but Muslim, classical Muslim right now, he actually believes in Matthew 22. And some someone somewhere started this, because uh, this is, literally going against every single uh well this is causing way more problems and the biggest problem the muslims right now from 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 tunisia to indonesia is that the classical muslim mind that madrasa trained guy with the quran and the hadith and the sira is never going to come into power he actually evades coming into power and then he keeps you know he's yapping about how bad the, the you know the political elite is from any country you pick them mm-hmm. and then you find out what's the masjid doing what is not doing anything from ever since October 7th, this uh, <clears throat> last year, I went f- from Australia to everywhere going with the single campaign that the masjid has fallen because the only solution was coming or supposed to come from the masjid. And that is to mobilize the youth into political dominance and gain back the power. Why are you then so optimistic on the one hand in terms of what you 
observe as a sentiment gravitating towards Islam, but at the same breath saying the masajid have lost it, yeah. we can't, we can't, we, the, 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 the students of knowledge, uh, maybe even some scholarly class, even though we don't have these terminologies in our tradition, how are you both optimistic but also saying that they failed? Well, the kind of movement is an amazing question because psychologically speaking, you can I can draw the patterns and anybody can of where the youth is actually trying to do their, you know, math, what kind of drawing boards are they using? They're using the Muslim Islamic drawing boards, but they're running the political equation now. And Modudi has a direct role to play with this. It's not just Modudi, because you're missing out on some few other names who are actually, Mulan Isaac, you should read into it. Of He's not going to be in English. He's going to be Punjabi and Arabi only. Mm. This, these are the kind of people who really injected that, you know, that, that sense that, you know, we need to take up real positions of political power and, you know, intellectual acumen. That's the movement I'm actually carrying to, to all. That's why I'm in England. So the kind of age group that is in university campuses and, you know, in other places where they're, they're in their 30s and you know, early 40s and literally teenagers, they're clinging on to this sort of, uh, sort of a content where they're actually debating and they're actually, you know, coming in thousands, literally thousands when I am, you know, in Pakistan. This is... Um, this has never happened before. That's why I'm hopeful. And if we can change the source of the definition of how a Muslim youth is supposed to present himself to the world, then, you know, that's just then, then it's game on. Let's look at, because you've mentioned uh, Maulana Maududi, rahimahullah. <clears throat> you've mentioned him. Now let's look at perhaps, I mean, I'm from Bangladesh. My parents are from there. That is my heritage. We were once East Pakistan. Many critics of this model Many critics of the claim that Pakistan ki matlab ki la ilaha illallah, that the first attempt at this project was a failure. Now, without drawing onto nationalist strings, we have, because this is not something we want to really uh, exacerbate, it's no good. But let's still look at the historical point. Why did this project called Pakistan, which was supposed to be a, a safe place for the Muslims to practice their faith, for their deen to be preserved, why was it hard to maintain its eastern wing? Okay, let me just try and be as brief as possible. When Jinnah had to leave a movement, had to lead a movement, he had to lead the movement of the mass. The mass was emotionally religious. But Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, the Muslims, and still the Muslims are the at the lowest of the hierarchy of you know social yep. at the social structure. Now, if you have to lead a mass which has absolutely no resource, you need to have you need those kind of political pawns which have some sort of a resource, uh, power, uh, money, uh, influence, and those are the people. And still, they are uh, people who are not religiously tuned. They were businessmen. They were nawabs, and they were you know people of you know good and big, big enough networks. They were connected with the whites, and you know. So on and so forth. So I would have done, and uh, Jinnah did what anyone would have done. That you know what, if I at this, since the religious mass does not have any uh, dime to spend, but they have the religious, you know, emotional thirst and the drive, I need the middle layer, which is absolutely not religious, but needs some sort of a position of power, because they did. By the way, they did get. They're still in power. Mm -hmm. So he had to get the mass a separate country a platform and finance it and mobilize it through the power and the structures that he already had to play with. Now, from Liaquat Ali Khan to Imran Khan, <laughs> these people don't represent the mass. You know, they don't even represent the religious uh, acumen or the, uh, you know, thirst or the emotional attachment of Islam, which the regular mass has. But if you had to play now, even if you have to play now in Pakistan, I won't be able to play with the religious you know, uh, clusters because they will not have the money for it. And I need to fuel this machine. So I'm not saying, you know, you know um, play the wrong hand. He was dealt these kind of cards and he had to pick from, you know, whatever he's, he's dealt from. And he, he played a good, he played a good hand. Now I know it was, uh, and, and, you know, if it is, if I go back in time, I, I can't even think of an advice to give to Jinnah that, you know what, this is gonna you know, turn out a more of a, you know, you know, shenanigan of, yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah a, secular a, a very state. secular nation. But uh, he'd be like, you know, tell me what else to do. Because we're talking about 
400 million Muslims now in mm. Bangladesh and Pakistan combined. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're free from all those, you know, structures that English and the Indian Hindu was naturally going to, you know, exert upon us. Their masajid are safe. They can slaughter cows for Eid al-Adha. Yeah. They, they have many of the ritualistic practices preserved. Well, that's, that's just a byproduct. The of first course. thing that, and the only real thing that they actually say was, our next generation to actually mobilize themselves into, you know, a global power. Inshallah. Inshallah. And that's the, the gift that Jinnah gave. So why did Bangladesh fail? Or why, why did East Pakistan fail? Again. Because I know it's a highly sensitive topic. No, you know, most of the Pakistanis. How do they, from your interactions, how do they see the events of 71 or the build up to 71? Well, again, it's going to happen again if, if the same sort of structures keep on, you know, uh, it is the lack of understanding of people like, you know, in my uh, age group that unless we mobilize and we give enough resource, intellectual resource to the mass, these people who are in going to be in power will always remain in power. And if they're any one of them has a self-serving interest, he'd sacrifice any one province, you know. Bengal was just one of the provinces, you know, Bojistan would be next, you know, Kashmir would be next, and in line, whoever has, you know, whatever to, to gain for his own self. It was a one or two, you know, one man's selfish interest that, you know, we, we actually went through whatever we went through. Mm. Otherwise, everybody knows what happened in the elections. And, sure, would you, when you won the yeah, 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 everybody knows them. Nobody can deny that, you know, there was an overwhelming majority that, you know, um, Mujib had. And uh, it just happened so that, you know, people, a few people, two or three families in power could have made that, could make that decision. That power should not be with this sort of a, a system. That's why I'm against democracy, by the way. You know, just because somebody has that sort of power is naturally going to corrupt a guy with absolutely no acumen of Islam, you know, so no sense of, of uh, personal justice. So this, this is a one man's uh, decision that, that, you know, you and I are calling each other from, you know, from across the flanks. Otherwise, you know, Jinnah would be as Jinnah for you as I, I actually I think it is. Yeah. He is, you know. So when you, how do you reconcile with the fact that on the one hand, every single Muslim country that exists today, there's 55 or 57, are in reality secular nation states? That's a different question. Yeah. See, that's the question I ask because in Pakistan. So in how do you reconcile that with Pakistan? Ki matlab ki Allah ilaha illallah? Are you then saying that is the general sentiments of the people? But it is a sentiment within the framework of the secular nation state. And no, you're the, trying to change that. Two types of Muslims, okay? The general Muslim is an emotional, superstitious Muslim. That's la ilaha illallah for you. They want the masjid to be free. They want to pray. They want to, you know, slaughter their own. They want to eat halal. They want to cover themselves without any you know, restriction. That's your general five pillars of Islam. That's the general Muslim mass. The average Muslim, yeah. Yeah. And that's, to me, it's not all of Islam. Actually, that's not even the start of Islam. Okay. We need a powerful Muslim system to keep these five pillars alive. You know what I'm saying? And that power pillar was never with the Muslim mass because mo that Muslim mass was driven by, you know, whatever was left for, from, from the, the whites and the, you know, the Nawabs and Uber, you know, doing whatever they could to please the, the white, you know, uh, government of uh, Victoria at that time. But now 57 states were not going to Victorian rule, right? No. The problem here is that in the commonality between the Pakistani and the Desi Muslim mass and the regular Muslim in Arabia and, you know, North Africa and, you know, Indonesia is the fact that we are trained to be secular. In the Islam is not secular. Absolutely not. You know what I'm saying? The Prophet is possible. literally, the first sunnah is politics. After the Nabuwa, the first sunnah is politics. Mm -hmm. And Muslims are trained not to go into politics. So, you know, if you're not going to lead the, 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 you know, the prayer, someone is going to, you know, take over. This is just a simple rule of thumb. And they did. And uh, now money determines in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, money determines who's going to lead the, 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 the house. Literally, money. So, P so PTI had no realistic hope in establishing Riyasat in Medina? 
I'm amazed that you even heard the word uh, because this is not a word which Pakistanis know they did meant it, you know. Yeah, but he's, he, they claimed it while coming into power. He, 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 listen, the regular mass is emotionally, superstitiously tuned into Islam. Yeah. So this word really sells. Riyasati Medina. Yeah. The society of Medina, the first Islamic state of Medina. Yeah, and I, I want to believe because I believe that Riyasati Medina is the only Riyasati that is going to work. Can Pakistan be that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Any any population, can, you know. It's, see, these two structures have to be intact and linked. The general mass, which is never going to be, you know, all academically correct and you know, knowledgeable and all, because that's general mass. That's why yeah. you call it general mass. Absolutely, yeah. oh, wow. If we give them these four resources: as moral action, moral capital, the mental capital, their you know, knowledge sets, their political capital, and their financial capital to raise. There you go. You got your Muslim to, you know, create their own structures of power. And not just create a new structure, just take back the structure, whichever they're, wherever they're from. Actually, my movement right now, the Awakening Tour, is to create or, you know, get people aware of these four structures because overseas, Pakistanis, and Bengalis, and Indians... Elaborate Muslim. a bit on those four then. You spoke about the four. Elaborate yeah. on those four. What does, that, what does that look like in terms of practical terms? Yeah, well... well it, it's, there's two two stages to it. One is the, well, three stages. One is the current stage, okay, where we know the landscape around the 57 countries of well, not just the 50, the whole globe, wherever the Muslims are, mm -hmm. and then the transitory state. This state is where the teenager right now is going to take power of whatever he's going to do in whatever career he's going to make in the next 20 years. We need that teenager right now envisioned and well grounded in that vision to take these four pillars by design, okay? And establish competence in these four pillars, measurable, get the financial independence, political capital has to be established. What does that mean? Because a lot of people would think that's ballot box. No, it's not. That's exactly no, what. But I'm telling you, a lot of Muslims in the West will think when when uh, by uh, say, know, yeah. summer, as soon as they hear politics, they will think uh, political engagement, voting, ballot box, lobbying, block well, voting. Mark Zuckerberg did not have a ballot box backing him up, but he still called the shots in you know the so U.S. elections. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's exactly what I want. And it's not just you know social media. I'm talking about real network. Okay, because if you have the political capital, and I'll tell you what, how to get that in, we have naturally the biggest platform for the financial capital as well. So let's just do the math on uh, the Desi Muslims only for now, just as a test case. So we're a massive group. Yeah, yeah, that's why we actually are the, the biggest, <laughs> biggest Muslim group. group. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Yeah, no, but uh, the strata I'm talking about is the overseas. Oh, the, the okay, the overseas yeah. Bengalis third, and the Pakistanis. Third, fourth okay. gen. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. No, well, no, you're talking England only, right? I'm talking okay. about globally. Okay. Because in, in Australia, it's the first gen Bengalis. Oh, yeah, of course, okay, yeah. of course. So of course, I just came sorry. from there. They were like, you know, we don't Sorry, know. I assumed everyone arrived in the 60s like us. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, not, yeah. <laughs> that's why, you know, I keep telling the, the Melbourne yeah. Muslims that, you know, I'm going to England because that's the center of the overseas Muslim yeah. movement. Because you guys are not half and half. You guys are not confusing the Desis in English. You guys are as English as King Charles, right? Yeah, <laughs> Even more sometimes. We are the oldest diaspora community in there the West. Go. Yeah, hence your generation is go not going to have that kind of cognitive dissonance from the Desi culture versus the English culture. You can actually drive the movement without having that, you know, uh, superstitiously defined, emotionally meshed up mm. version of Bengal, Islam, and England yeah. <laughs> combined together. Yeah. Basically an identity crisis. That is the dissonance, right? So what I need is a very confident group of people. I'm talking about kids. I'm talking about from 14th year till the 24th, 25th year. That 10 year strata so that we can actually envision very clearly that they need to gain power in money. They need to be very competent, okay? It's not a fluke and it's not a Jewish lobby that every Jewish product is actually performing really good, okay? They actually have competent uh, machine yes. that works. Let's call a spade a spade. Uh, their processes in their companies are, you know, really well. Just like Japan. Japan is not a Jewish lobby no, <laughs> established country. They, they're just methodically very efficient. There you go. Very yeah. efficient. So, uh, we need that sort of competence. Just like that. Let's just come back to the political capital. The Gulf countries have those. Some would argue. They would argue. They say the Turks have them. The have Gulf what? countries have them. The Processes, modernity, 
pro, uh, you know, what you're describing in terms of how efficient the Japanese are, they'll say that, that them elements of work, I'm just trying to play counter here. So yeah, I know, I know. And I'm trying to actually counter or rebut you through a technical uh, answer. Some would say the Turks are administratively one of some of the best in the world. Well, so they, they better have to, to show something for it because, <laughs> yeah, Japan has. I mean, it's not just Six Sigma and, uh, you know, your, your regular management spiral that actually brings, you know, the finest possible products out of Japan. Uh, it's the product that actually talks for themselves. G give me top three or any three products coming from this part of the, the world. Which I can't think about. of any. Yeah, because there aren't any. And if, I'm sure there are some. But not top three. Yeah, they're not in the, you know, in, in, the, in the landscape because they're not just, they're missing out on, you know, the propaganda of these sort of processes. And Japan, by the way, never markets these processes. We market Japan's processes. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, you can not name any one man from Japan, but you can name a hundred companies on top of your head. You know, this is how the consumer himself or the, the base itself markets the product. So uh, this is something which Muslims are missing. I'm telling you this. I mean, we're Desis, we know it firsthand. Anything that a Muslim touches, he ruins. Okay, I'm talking about the it's quality of the product. You are, and I are Muslims and we are enthusiasts. We are actually Dais. And we ourselves are never gonna buy a Muslim made product because we know it's gonna suck. Well, there'll be something wrong with it. Yeah, we even the movies, you know those cartoons that they make for the, for the kids? Yeah. Even there, it's like, how, how do you ruin something which is going to come out of a computer? You know, it's like, how do you ruin the colors of a software? You know, it's, 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 it's that bad. And so it, it, it is coming from the, the seat from the last generation. The, lack of understanding of the standards. Okay, and I'm talking about Japan specifically so that it, it doesn't become a Muslim Jew or a Muslim Christian. No, no, sure, or, you know, sure. It's not a religious. And Japan is a great example. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's the finest example. All, Allah always gives us a neutral entity so that we can actually, you know, get rid of our biases mm -hmm. and come come into, you know, the, the real light. So this is, this is uh, one angle of looking at it. But what I really require from- It all uh, sounds motivational. Really? Yeah. Well, let me demotivate you, hold on. <laughs> let, uh, yeah, yeah, let me, let me, let me just get, get to work. Uh, no, you know what, this is, uh, the overseas Muslims better be motivated for because you can understand the meaning of these words because you've experienced them. In Pakistan or Bangladesh, they wouldn't even be able to understand or experience the reality of the concept we're talking about. Bilkul. There's a difference in the IQ. Yeah. That's why I'm relying on the overseas, you know, diaspora of, you know, the last two generations, they did their job. I mean, they came in to, you know, drive cabs to have three jobs a week so that boys like you can gain their acumen. Are you telling us to go back to motherland? No, no, no. I'm trying to tell you never to go back, gain power here, build structures in Bangladesh and Pakistan. You know what I'm saying? You need to be, see, let me just finish this, this political capital the concept. What can I do in Bangladesh without the bribing and the, and the, and, and the lobbying of Awami League? I'll tell you what to do first of all. You, we in overseas Muslims need to connect every single person together. I'm talking about everybody counts. Uh -huh. Even if Pakistan and Bangladesh do not connect with us, it doesn't really matter. You need to connect with the Amer American youth, the Canadian youth, the European youth, especially the Scandinavian youth. Mm -hmm. You have no idea that's gold. There's very few, but Scandinavia is training them. Now you want to compare Japan with anything else. You got to compare Japan with Sweden and you know Norway. Yeah, yeah, Norway. I'm thinking Norway's top of the food chain right now in terms of the way they've actually created the social structures. I know we and I, you and I, don't not really agree to you know the philosophy behind those structures, but the performance of that structure is flawless. Okay. Now, just like that, those platforms are enabling the Muslim mind. If exactly, you know given proper knowledge of politics and how, how to dominate. They do not have to dominate Norway. They have to enter the politics of Norway and call the shots around the globe. That's from, what, from Norway? From Norway. People from Norway are calling the shots in Bangladesh and mm. Pakistan. <laughs> okay. people, some people in Sweden are literally writing the foreign policy of Pakistan as we speak. That's how it works. There are enough people in the Biden cabinet 37 to be exact, who are actually calling the next aid to go to Israel. That's good work, good job. And that's how people should behave as community, right? <laughs> Muslims are not doing that. I'm not going to diss them for doing their job right. I mean, there's a big, you know, um, problem between 
me versus them in terms of the, you know, or whatever's going on because of their philosophy or whatever's going on. And a, a non-Muslim might be watching this thinking, well, is Sahil proposing that one day the Muslims will be right in the foreign policy of our countries? Sitting in Dhaka or, or in Islamabad, do they want us, do they want... No, no, they, they they'll be sitting in England for the next, the next 50 years writing the policies of their countries, but they'll be very Muslimish policies. Okay. Yeah, if you're not Muslim and listening to this and thinking, yeah, that is the plan, man. That's exactly what I want. I mean, it's not a secret. I'm not a, from the Freemasons, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Illuminati, this all game, all this, yeah. you know, this whole thing is very, very clear. I mean, I believe in what I'm actually selling. I think mean, this is the, the, you know, the rule of Allah, you know, it's, it's for the world. It's not just for the Muslims, but starting with the Muslims, if you know, if you cannot get your own house in order, why the hell would they act even, you know, listen to how, how right or how good looking our policies are. So you yeah. need to make them work wherever they're supposed to, you know, work. And f first and foremost, Bengalis are going to listen to you way more than, you know, the, the, the Koreans, because <laughs> you're more relevant and they're really aspiring to be you right now. So. I'm talking about 30 odd million Muslims around the world, which came from these three countries only. Okay. Yep. And if they can connect and then, the, you know, Arabian diaspora, which right now is, you know, growing in numbers, yes. yeah. we can connect overseas and then grow our kids into, you know, of a single network. Then we call the shots in more country than you can imagine right now, not just 57. I, I know you have this IMS system. Yeah, um, that I, is I, the, yeah, uh, the purpose. I, but are you talking about a top down or bottom up or a bit of both in terms of change? No, well, they both have to work side by side. So you're not one or the other? No, no, no. I have, they, they have, see, this is what happened to Pakistan. It's not going to work if you're going to choose either one of them. You have to understand the power of both of them and the power of integrating both of them. Ah, that's a very difficult task there. It is difficult, but you know what? Politics is going to... To you mix know, the gradual with the radical. Yeah, we need the radicals. Otherwise, you know, um, it's not going to have enough motivation for the, you know, the, for the long haul. So why do we need the gradual? We, because we need to maintain. It's not just, you know, for you and me. We so need our great, great grandkids to actually, you know, reap the... So how do you, how do you bring them together? That's where the political, you know... Um, how do, you, so how do you, so I want you to explain IMS in light of this. Uh -huh. For ummatic Islamic revival, whether it be intellectual, political, military, wherever it may be, there are those who say it will all happen when Imam Mahdi comes. Yeah, there'll, not for that. Uh, there, there'll yeah. be those who say, well, hold on, we've been dealt a particular hand. That hand is the global order of nation states, and we need to deal with this system. So we can gradually skeptics make some most of them are there are those who say heck this we'll just take Whatever power we ourselves can. we'll fight them we'll fight the existing stooges or we'll work to do military coups wherever it is yeah then there's those who say well hold on we're not an ummah worthy of victory we're perpetually sinful we're not worthy of this victory. Fix ourselves up first. Allah will not change the situation of a people until they change it amongst themselves. So you have this kind of four or five ways of thinking. Two more I can think of, but what's you the, get what's, what's the other two? The guy who actually believes that this is, you know, uh, the exact opposite of what you should do. But then we have case studies where Muslims, regardless of, you know, whether they're practicing or not, are in power. You know, in every country, yeah, yeah. you know, especially our country. <laughs> actually, it's the worst possible example of a Muslim, but it's the best example of how to get in power. You know what I'm saying? So the case studies, you know, are, are speaking for themselves. So where does IMS fit into those? I'll tell you, IMS those? is, you know, I train and I'm trying and to- And it stands for? Islamic messaging system. It's a propaganda machine so that we can get the, you know, the right sort of concepts developed for intellectual mm -hmm. and psychological warfare. If it's not an intellectual warfare worthy concept, let's just, you know, don't waste some time on it. Because we need to raise the IQ, that's intellectual warfare. We need to raise the IQ of everybody, mm -hmm. okay? Psychological warfare is about tuning the behavior of people, making that, you know, next two, three steps, uh, um, you know, be taken by all of those classes of people. Now, whatever classes that you mentioned right now, they exist, but look at them from the eye of a chess player. Some of them are the, you know, the, the enemy. They're going to be fighting against you, but some of them aren't. People who are actually, you know, uh, emotionally attached to the religion, they will be a part of your board. Mm -hmm. They will be part of your team, yeah. and you can actually use them instead of just fighting against them or quarreling and wasting your time and energy and actually distributing power and focus 
use them. We need to, you know, you know, abolish the ego of a few groups so that they can do whatever they're doing. For example, you know, those those classic Sufis are never going to be into it. Most of the Muslims trained in our country are into Sufi stick, you know, personal tazkiyah, enough philosophy only. They were like, you know what? The more you're going to go into power, the more you can say that you're not going to make it in the day of judgment. So let's just, you know, leave the power for the, those, these kind of, you know, greedy people. And that's the bigger problem I'm trying uh, to solve. You get Salafis like that as well, who are also of this thinking. Maybe oh. not as much as the Sufis. No, 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 I'm just saying Sufis and Makli goes, uh, divorces politics for the sake of religion. Salafis don't do that. Salafis think it's khuruj if you do it. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, there's a spectrum of them, but yes, most yeah, definitely, yeah. most yeah. definitely. So, well, I don't want to just use the word Salafi. There's another word for it. But what I'm saying is regular Muslim is in this sort of casting. Yeah. Now, we know the casting. But I treat them as pawns and queens and bishops and rooks. I don't, I, 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 because we need to use all of them. Anybody who's got anything to do with Islam is calling himself Muslim, other than the fact that he's just got an Allah locket and he just does everything else and he just thinks that, you know, I'm not going to be able to do anything about it and I make sure that nobody does. That's the only person who's not on the board. Otherwise, everybody who's at any level trying to activate his family, his sons and daughters into coming into knowledge. And I mean, that's just about everybody that we can actually use. So you're saying all those differences can actually be positively utilized. They are, they are really some, most of them are being used by somebody. <laughs> Otherwise- From the Democrats to the Jihadis, to the Khilafis, to the Hizbis, to the Brelvis, to the Deobandis, to the Ikhwanis, to saying they all. Well, three of them are in the same flank anyway, the Ikhwanis mm -hmm. and the Jihadis and the uh, Hizbis. Hizbis. They're in the same flank, right? So they're your forerunners. We need to tune the movement with all of them combined. But they have deep methodological differences. Yeah, we can. Technique is the only flaw that we've already had. We are suffering from wrong techniques. Mm -hmm. But intent and, you know, uh, the emotionality of all of these people. They're all, you know, connected to each other. They, you know, these yeah. are the only three radicals that would die for the other ones. The other ones wouldn't do anything <laughs> with these. You know what I'm saying? So I see power in both of them. But that's not what I'm, I, I don't even want to tag them. I want to understand, I want our youth to understand that these are pieces on the pond. They're not the enemy. They're all usable pieces. And when overseas Muslims, or even Muslims in our local lands, come into those Bengalis and Pakistanis come into the right acumen and intellect and the overseas come into the political power, oh, you got yourself a new Israel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we can make a new Israel anywhere we want to because of the numbers that we, both of our countries have, we can make it sooner than they can. I mean, we don't need any Balfour. We are Balfour written, it's written right here. Some would be watching this thinking of Sahil Bais very optimistic and whilst we appreciate and acknowledge fully that the prophetic standpoint and mindset is one of optimism and one of Husn al in Allah Allah will make us victorious it's not a case of if more of a case of when and all that stuff and we fully subscribe to that but the reality has a different story Sahil Bhai it can be argued if we look at the economic state of Pakistan if we look at the internal turmoil if we look at the list of issues that we have its reliance on external aid whilst the optimism is something that we would embrace and we want to subscribe to and incorporate to change our political destiny and that of the Ummah, let's be honest about it, whether you look at Pakistan, whether you look at Bangladesh, whether you look at any of the majority of the Muslim majority countries outside of the Gulf, they are in tatters. They're a mess. Yeah. Yeah. There is no, there is no autonomy. Forget about even people moving or shifting for the sake of Allah. They're barely moving and sh moving for the sake of their own people. So what I guess what I'm trying to posit to you is, no, I got it. how do you reconcile prophetic optimism with a daunting reality? Currently, yeah, landscape. See, uh, understand how the, the, the group moves. The whole group is moving in, his, in a very peculiar pattern. It's not chaos. Okay, it looks like because, you know, when we go into a picture, we get, you know, the whole thing gets blurry. It's not actually chaos. This is a classic movement of a group which is devout of power. The div but if a group divorces the concept of gaining power, then this happens. This is natural. You pick out the history of human beings and any group which actually does not have a doctrine which 
energizes and enforces and endorses getting into power and dominate with the system of morality, of any kind of morality. We have the, the absolute morality in the Quran. Yeah. Then, you know, you got yourself a game. And I don't want to, you know, push people to think that, oh, I've got the solution. No, I'm just saying, I understand how the behavior works. Solution is in the Quran. I mean, it's a given. It's a presupposition that if people do not understand or believe that the Quran is a political solution, then yeah, you can turn off this podcast right now. But people who know that Prophet Islam did this, Sahabas follow it up, and the human behavior took over. We needed more people in the right places to maintain or herd this whole, you know, whole whole group into mm -hmm. maintaining that 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 movement towards, you know. Uh, going forth for the next two, three, four hundred years. We, we couldn't, and we, we're never going to do that unless, of course, we understand how psychology works. This is what group psychology does. Not just Muslims. You pick out any nation right now, even Christians. The whole church is crying about whatever we're crying about. Two priests talking about, you know, whatever the Bible Belt is going through in Milwaukee right now. Literally, word to word, they're going to be talking about the same thing. But you know what? They're suffering from Matthew 22. Somebody wrote it, and I know why Matthew would write it. He was a tax collector. He, 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 that's the only time Bible talks about money. Render to Caesar what belongs yeah, to Caesar. Yeah, he was talking about the taxes. He was not even talking about powers. But, okay, let's assume that they didn't know what they're talking about, okay, because there's a little too much going on there. But their book is stopping them. Our book is saying, Their book is saying, leave the power to Caesar and just do your prayer. You know what I'm saying? So, I was just saying, hold on to the book with, with strength. Yeah, not just strength, but define the strength yeah, and, and, and maintain it. Maintain it. So, uh, this group of Muslims in the current last landscape is behaving literally according to natural law of human psychology. This is what they require is the definition of the, at the source. Muslims have to be trained into coming into dominant power, which is politics. You know what I'm saying? And competence, which is knowledge set. And, of course, moral correctness, so that uh, we can maintain it to the uh, next three, four generations. Because politics is going to be here regardless of whether evil or good groups are going to, to, to stay. Because mm -hmm. politics is a natural, innate disposition of the man. It's the management of mankind's affairs. It's always yeah, yeah. going to be there. It's innate. Yeah. Be, I mean, even if you don't want it, someone's going to take it. It's always going to be there. Yeah. So why are we not using the Quran to actually, you know, politicize and, you know, combine and make sure the structures are morally correct and um, justifiable under the Sira. This is what Umar al-Khattab did. Umar al-Khattab raised a lot of alarms. If you read the Sira in, the, in his last days, Umar al-Khattab, to me, is the last, you know, uh, glimmer of the real system. Because the last uh, days of Umar al-Khattab, he's keep on warning, and, you know, Hosef bin Jaman, when he talks about... Uh, the death of Umar Khattab. He says that the door will be broken, not opened. Okay, and this actually shows that you know what we, we're going to break the system in the last, in the, the way we're going to actually you know deal with the last, you know the way we're going to interrupt the reign of Umar Khattab. That's human behavior. That's human psychology. So we need to be really clear as to how to create a structure and maintain it. These are the two things. No, I can I can quote case studies of Muslims and non-Muslims who created structures from these four pillars. Actually, they created it with less than four pillars, from you know, the Greeks to the Romans to the Persians to the, you know, the Muslims, and you know, in the recent few hundred years of worth of history. But unless you have these four pillars, you're not going to be able to maintain it. Now, right now, I what I see is guys your age, girls your age, they can understand what I'm saying. Of with the same age. Yeah, you know, I'm talking about in the, in the 20s. I'm assuming you're in your 20s. Twenties? <laughs> right I'm 35. Awesome. So, okay, well, you carry yourself really well then. So, so what I'm saying is, boys and girls in their teens and 20s, they need to be trained into the fact that unless you're in the power, you're not a good Muslim, sorry. See, now that's the de change of definition. Because the definition is literally against what I, this, this statement for the last few hundred years. Mm -hmm. And I personally believe that it started with Yazid bin Mavia. I personally believe that. Because the definition that they're actually pumping into our blood of what is khuruj and what is not, Hussein al-Islam doesn't even apply. You know, it doesn't even apply on Hussein al-Islam. According to their definition, current definition, mm -hmm. Hussein al-Islam becomes a kharji, you know what I'm saying? No, no. So this is something which is against the very essence of Islam. 
Omar Khattab, why do you think I keep quoting Omar Khattab to everywhere I go? Because he represents dominance. He represents the political might of Islam. He represents a philosophy that you need to keep the power to make sure you can herd the whole ummah under the rule of Allah. Let me just quickly come in there because one of the biggest criticisms internally among some who see themselves as traditionalists would say that this whole revivalist struggle, irrespective of what group, what muslim, what movement, doesn't matter. But this kind of ummatic desire to come into power and, and politics and have your own state and all this stuff. This is actually a post-colonial mindset where we are actually reflecting that of the colonizer. I'm telling you, there's some like... Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I get that. I get that While Al-Halaq and many of these others have been cited by saying, look, there's no such thing as an Islamic state. You might get, you read to an Islamic nation state. You have tradition like Hamza Yusuf and many others who I have know. said that, look, you know, this whole thing about power, you've misunderstood it. Allah will give you power. It's, it's, it's a means, it's not the end. Yeah? Meaning it's not the end goal. If Allah do, gives do it, you the it. power is going to come to you. That's what they believe in. Yeah, but so the whole kind of, yeah, but once you're ready for it, Allah yeah, will give it, but yeah. it's not the sole objective. They don't understand the human behavior then. I'll te tell you the two hadith. We know the, you know, the whole uh, Sira and how, you know, from Abu Bakr Siddiq to Ali bin Abi Talib, the whole, you know, system was carried forth. And then we ruined the hell out of the system. After Ali bin Abi Talib, you know, we know what happened and, you know. You went to kingship and, and family, family. No, no, it's no. not about the, the, the order of management. It's about the, the plight of the people. Okay. No, this is going to happen again. See, the Prophet is teaching us psychology. He was just not reading into it. When Isa ibn Muhammad is going to come in, he's going to reign the planet literally through his kingdom. Four years okay, ago. his kingdom. Okay, it's, it's monarchy. And after forty years of the departure of the real death of Isa ibn Maryam, people are going to go into so much of a chaos. Then Allah is going to lift the Quran. It's like you know, no more for this. No more for this. 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 You know. Human being are not worthy of this, and then the day of judgment is going to come. Day of judgment cannot cannot come, even if there is a single Muslim on the planet. That means even after the kingdom of Isa ibn Maryam, and every single household will be Muslim. Yep, people are still going to go out of Islam so much so that no one is going to remain a Muslim. This is classic human psychology being taught by our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Understand how human beings behave. Now, what happens after the the the, the death of Isa ibn Maryam? The power goes to the regular folks. So, if the power is with the right people, it is going to you know bear the fruit. This is what happened to uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar Khattab and you know Osman Ghani and uh, Ali bin Abi Talib. The right people had power. We had the, the the right sort of you know structural you know maintenance going on. As so power is necessary. Tazkiya is going to maintain the power. And I, you know what? I believe that Tazkiya nafs is uh, the of ultimate purpose, like Hamza Yusuf. But I uh, believe that you need to make sure that everybody can do Tazkiya. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, you're just going to do it for yourself. The politician's job is to make sure the system is Tazkiya friendly for everybody. Every Muslim, because there is no compulsion to bring people into Islam, so the system has to be there. But the ease of Tazkia can only become come from the system. For example, Scotland. Right now, I just came from Glasgow. I'm not just talking about Glasgow. Even Pakistan is a classic case study here. Okay, let's just take Pakistan first of all, so that you know people think, but not think that I'm being biased. But the classical Islamic laws cannot be practiced in in Pakistan because the political the people in power do not understand Islam, even though they would want to. For example, the law of inheritance. You cannot inherit your property to your grandson. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have to inherit to your son. But in Pakistan, you have to, if your son is dead. Mm -hmm. Okay? Where, does, where is this sense coming from? It's, this sense is coming directly from Scandinavia. This sense is def defined in, on paper in a legislation. Okay, and so on and so forth. I'm just giving you an example. Scotland, the RME, you can, you have to include all, I mean, I went to the, I was coming from Glasgow and there was a prayer room on the airport. And I was like, awesome, man. You know, and I went to the prayer room, there's a prayer mat, and then there's this, you know, this big murti. Yeah. <laughs> right there. The multi-faith room. Yeah, I know. And it's not just that prayer room in the airport, it's the schools in Scotland. Okay, who's calling the shots in that? Hamza Yusuf, the other Hamza Yusuf? Okay. 
<laughs> it's ironic that you know we're talking about Hamza Yusuf. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. Hamza Yusuf is not calling the shots in this. He's a poor puppet of the system. The power structures are coming from somewhere else. And you'll be amazed as to how how some countries and some people in those countries are calling those power structures, uh, uh, energizing the power structure, maintaining it per se, because mm-hmm. they didn't come up with it. A lot of people come together. It's, it's like more of a deep state concept of where the power actually is, you know, conceptualized. But they're maintained by people like these. Do you accept that there is a deep state in Pakistan and many other Muslim states? Oh, I think if there were no, if there is a deep state, which there is, then Pakistan is one of the many that they 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 better be affecting Pakistan. Otherwise, it's not deep enough. Okay, but is a deep state necessary for survival? Well, it had to be because see, this is why. I believe that our Islamic system has to be established. There is no other solution. There is no anti-matter for this deep state matter. Mm. Okay, they have because Islamic system is the only system that goes from top down and bottom up at every single element. The audit is for every single element in the system, from people to processes. Deep state is the only thing that you cannot audit because there is no one man that you can audit. Okay, there's no one group of people. There's no one country. There's no one law. There's so much going on yeah. that even if you take out a few, they're going to be a lot more than just you know. So you cannot just you know pick out one. It's a machine. It's, it's well, it's, the machine is a oversimplified way of yeah. saying it because we all know it's, it's a very fluid concept. Islam, the system of Islam, the political installation, and the understanding of how human beings behave coming together is the only antidote for this this deep deep, deep state concept and you think i don't know what's going to happen even if they, we do establish the islamic system in any one of these countries or the world there could be, there all could be, hell is going to break loose cuz be deep we're actually calling you know poking the bear right now uh-huh. right there right on the face actually so can you see this happening without little to no bloodshed said by cuz there could no, be no no there will be blood there will be blood and you know what i got a book backing it up cuz if there is blood i know what to do about this what's the book the quran you know this is the only book with enough ass- aggression assertiveness and absolutely no inferiority complex of the reader it is a hakami book it is not a book with please no requests we need a book which commands there is they we are the only nation with a book that actually commands I mean, imagine the, the the superior psychology that it takes for a Muslim to implement the book. I mean, there are no pleas and requests. So you have a book, you can go to any any sort of power, which the Sahabas did and which our youth can, but we need a transitory period where they can actually have competence and political network. Otherwise, they won't be able to get that sort of an assertiveness in their speech. That's why I'm relying on English Muslims and American and, you know, youth like you. because the pakistanis and the bengalis are trained not to be assertive that's the problem you know actually that's something that they utilize on this hasina woman mm. okay ironic that her name is hasina eh? <laughs> and 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 uh the pakistani political elite they're they're literally feeding off this inferiority complex of you know a regular man's assumption that he's bigger than what he actually is they're actually laughing at the fact that there is no genie man you're the one who creates that genie and you you know you bow to that genie i, I don't even have that genie just because i carry myself like this you actually put you know 10 inches on my on my height and just because you're suffering and they just feed off of it on twitter there's this um there's this, well, on, on muslim twitter there's this stereotype slash meme of it's only desi muslims or desi origin muslims who always think about khilafat islamic change it's only these guys that think of these things the average arab or average maghrebi or average turk doesn't think like this i know that's a caricaturing of reality i know oh that God, is a caricature yeah, that's the exact opposite of actually yeah. desis don't even think about it yeah. turks are still hungry for it have you ever think in 2024 is going to be the big yeah that's it it's going to be the year muslim mean was not a desi <laughs> movement say it could is not from you know mia wali yeah or silat yeah bringing the podcast to a close there's a lot we've you've presented in terms of change mm-hmm. you've proposed the four elements of that change that if it's unlocked and it synergizes then inshallah we can access potential that we're still unaware of there's a heavy reliance by the sounds of it on western diaspora communities on, on the IQ yeah IQ. and we can actually have that uh, in the in our own lands But, but till we have that we we see 
let's call a spade a spade. English land still calls the shots on a lot more political structures than yeah, Anglosphere, the, Western Anglosphere still calls the shots. Yeah, I mean, Asia of Age of Enlightenment and the First Second World War. These mm-hmm. are the two events that actually, you know, has done whatever is done. The landscape is set by these two big events. Mm-hmm. Now, anybody who's on this side of the flank will naturally have to use these flanks, good or bad, right or wrong. I mean, you, you're English, no matter what you do, you're going to have to use the system. Mm. Now, you can use England just like any Cambridge professor is using Cambridge for Israel, for any amendment in the UN, you know, or any policy coming from the UN or from America. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's assume that, you know, we had those kind of professors, you know, with the power of amending, you know, constitutions here and there. My God. You know, I'm just talking about putting in numbers. You know what? I was doing the math on, uh, because of a few books I'm reading. The less than 13 people who literally, who who, call, who were behind the whole Polish, German, well, not German, Austrian, uh, you know, um, you clusters right? getting into consent with, with, you know, getting Chamberlain down and oh, Churchill yeah, yeah, yeah. up. Like 13. It just takes the power of... World War II. Yeah, mm. so it's, 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 it's that simple. I'm not saying, you know, oh, 30, we need the 13 warriors of Islam. No, we need 130,000. You know what I'm saying? Because mm. we, we're trying to take care of not a tiny little land of Israel, which I don't want to use the word. I'm talking about a very big model in Bangladesh or Pakistan or wherever, or in Indonesia, could be anywhere. So that people can actually understand that, you know, if you can work for that, it's just like, you know, um, the potential difference, you know, this is how the electric current flows from high potential to low potential. If you can create a high potential there, every, you think people were against the system of Islam at the time of the Prophet Islam, everybody liked it. Even if they were the enemies, they knew, you know what, this is naturally making some, a lot of sense. We would rather have our kids and daughters in that system where they're protected and laws are right there. They're being practiced by every single element of the, the whole food chain. And people who are not in power would rather not be in power because they're kind of fruit that they're reaping from the people in power because of the moral correctness. You know, this is, this is I, again, since I have gone through the detail, I'm a Muslim, I understand the Quran and the Sira. I can sense that, I can smell the fruit, I still haven't tasted it. I haven't seen the whole system in play. Imagine when people were actually tasting the fruit, you know, that's why the big uh, age of Islam started from a city. The age of Islam started from a city, not because Umar Khattab had a shimmering sword, you know. People actually understood the system. They knew that these laws are actually, you know, the Jews themselves said the finest possible time that they, from the, the 3,000 years, were under the reigns of Islam. Mm-hmm. How come? You know, it's not a joke. It's not something which I'm coming in an anecdotal case. It's 800 year. Single. You know, it's... Written, so, in, written in their own books. Yeah, yeah. So they can have their golden years and we can't. Because, oh, it's utopian, it's, you know, it's a, it's a dream of Saladim, you know, it's, it's, it's adolescence of a, if you, you know, of a, a boy from Pakistan who just, you know, read yes. too much Madhudi or, 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 you know, comes from the, you know. You just described the meme, the memes. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that is what's claimed. Yeah, I know, they call me the, you know, second coming of Madhudi, you know, a, a self-imposed, uh, you know, belief system of Islam or, you know, I, they don't use the word Khilafa as much as I would like them to, but, you know, they, they just, because I don't even use this word Khilafa. I, I use the word system. That's something they would understand better because I don't care whether it's a king or a guy or, you know, comes from democracy or whatever. It has to come from a power wherever the structures of power currently exist. So, you, so according to this envisaged uh, revivalist system, could it come through the OIC, the Arab League? No, no, Arabs, I'm sorry. They've, uh, see, they're not in, in any, anywhere close to, uh, I, I think OIC, I, I would rather go to Paris to, 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 to get more results from OIC, you know? I mean, it's, it's that simple. I mean, it's literally, I mean, I picked that city for Why can't they be a pawn in your game, in your chess game? They are, uh, their kids are. Their kids are. But they aren't. No, they aren't. I'll tell you what. I mean, we both should know. I mean, you're here. You're from Hyde Park and everything's going on. I mean, everyone knows. I would rather have uh, Shamsi sitting there and I'm going to you know, tell him. <laughs> like, you know, dude, you, damn, you use Islam and use the word Aqidah so that Jews cannot actually mobilize themselves into politics. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you kidding me with this? Salman Farsi can, you know, 
straight up criticize Omar Khattab face to face. But no, we can't criticize, you know, you know, our leaders. That's called being khuruj, khuruj, you know, it's only the job of the scholars. And you know, Imam Kaaba is actually inaugurating the cinema. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> crazy. I mean, it's crazy. And you think, uh, but I'm not coming any clues because I didn't give bail to you know MBS or anything. I mean, I can talk about it. That's that's even in alliance with your own, you know, aqidah as well. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. Uh, but why can't? But why can't? Why can't uh, bodies like the OIC and the Arab League? be part of the pawns for positive change that you've mentioned earlier on they are designed to bow so if you get power from the outside they're going to bow to it don't worry about it i mean it's their akida you know that yeah. <laughs> it's their akida. So, so so what you're actually saying is then then, then this proposed system can't coexist with the nation state then uh a transit in the transition it doesn't really matter uh even if there are lines drawn on the map okay. nato is a single body eh? European Union is a single body, but there are lines drawn between Germany and France. It works, but we can. Sam, I'm, telling, I'm giving a lot of hints to the kids who are, uh, who are aspiring to, you know, see, I'm talking to that boy or a girl, but, you know, boys can really get it because, you know, man is designed for power, okay? Our psychology comes into a dopamine cycle for power. I don't want you to think of uh, Bill Gates or, you know, Elon Musk or Steve Jobs going from Budapest to, you know, uh, Baltimore in his plane trying to do his commercial math of how many dollars. I want Muslims to be traveling in, you know, different streets of the world and, you know, in their own cities and others in attending different conferences where they're going to call the shots and how the globe is going to move. This is real power. This is what Islam is demanding. This is when I'm envisioning for the Muslim youth, I'm envisioning those meetings where you're actually going to be writing policy, which is going to cause not millions, but billions of people to come into correctness. And people understand how powerful your pen becomes. Okay. So this is literally what, you know, Sahabas were doing. Like, as literal as I'm going to make it. I mean, Omar Khattab, Ali bin Abi Talib, you know, in the time of the Prophet they were being trained to make sure that, you know, this power is maintained properly. So this is what every Prophet uh, does. 124,000 Prophet came in, took the power, uh, and implemented it, installed it, gave it to their people, and they maintained it as much as they could, and then... Until the need for another messenger came and so yeah, forth. Well, yeah, they, no, they, they relieved themselves out of the power. Sometimes they even divorced it. Mm. Uh, in the Quran, Allah Azawajal literally says, then I gave this to the that Jews, so. yeah. and uh, then to the Christians, the Nasara, and then they threw it on the floor. When I say, Aqamu Torah, they just don't do Aqamu Torah. They just do Torah. Aqamu Torah is to install and implement Torah. You know, a common Torah is not, you know, because a lot in the, in the, I'm talking about Surah Maida, uh, verse 68 here. Allah is addressing the Ahlul Kitab. So it's not that they don't believe in the book. Allah is saying, oh, Ahlul Kitab, implement the Torah. A common Torah. So it, it's not about, oh, them believing in the Torah. They already believe. That's why they call Ahlul Kitab. Okay, read the verse and I'll tell you, there's so many. I'm just talk, talking about this, this psychological sense and the structure the Quran builds inside our visions, in our minds. So I need boys to come into power and you know, your pens and your words should matter to every country in the world. You know, at least start with your own and then some and then all. This, this is how some people are still running the globe. And why can't Muslims do that? And even if it comes down to you know, belief versus belief, a principle disagreement, it's okay. We know the solution to that, it's okay. We have different pieces on the board. <laughs> My final question to you is that there's been a lot of appeal. Before to I let you, uh, just, you hold on to that. As soon as we start playing this game, mm -hmm. you'll be amazed as to how new pieces are going to come in. People are waiting for these sort of Muslims to come into power and eloquence and you know competence. Literally, the lower should be competence first. First, we become competent, then we'll become powerful. That's how natural order is. As soon as you're going to become competent and you're going to talk about the word power, all of a sudden new pieces are going to start to structure themselves on the board. And then you're not going to have these kind of castes. You're going to have literally non-Muslims coming into an alliance. That's when you're going to understand the you know, meaning of the hadith. When Imam Mahdi is going to become in, a lot of other forces are going to come in for, you know, give their allegiance to, to Imam Mahdi from the Jews and the Christians. This is how it works. 
I mean, I started to come to, to, to go to Australia and in England. I'm just talking about these four pillars, eh? And the local community is really running towards me. And those resourceful people with kids, their parents, they understand. Mashallah. Everybody wants the kids to be, you know, competent, educate, financially independent, politically sound, and, you know, implementing all of that with the purpose of the Quran. I mean, why wouldn't they? I mean, I'm not saying anything which and any, any father or mother wouldn't want. Mm -hmm. I want your kids to be competent and financially secure and politically savvy. What's, what's wrong with that? If I were a, you know, a rabbi or a Jewish man saying that in Israel, they would be sending me to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard to, you know, to propagate that so that overseas you Jewish... You need to mobilize yourself and put yeah, it into literally, use. Yeah, that's the word I use, to mm. mobilize the youth. Mm. Now, you can understand it. Bengalis won't in Dhaka. They won't be able to understand the real so meaning that's my last word. question to you. Uh -huh. Your advice and your appeal appears to be a lot centered around on an IQ basis, maybe on a financial basis, the Western diaspora. What about the average village boy who goes to college oh, the, see, average, the, the average the average pakistani or indian or bangladeshi who is actually poor and and you know things aren't looking great for him in terms of further studies financial stability you know let's be honest about it if you look at bangladesh and pakistan just two examples just two examples because it's our heritage it's our background the average banda is poor the average banda Life's not looking great for him in a material sense, you know. He'll go to college, he may have a laugh or two, play a bit of cricket with his friends. I'm talking about, especially in the rural areas. Not talking about city boys, town boys. Because I'm talking about there's a huge demographic of those who don't have access to the things that we have access to. What's their job in this game? What's their job? What's their role in the revival? Okay, the solution is in the Quran. Okay, it's a little tough to swallow for a lot of people who are going to listen to this. But generally, Muslims are poor because of the lack of system of Islam, okay? The Quran actually talks about it directly in these very words. Fawqihim wa tahtihim. Things are going to come to you. The Rahmah is going to come to you. Resources are going to come to you if you implement the system. Because if you're not going to implement the system, don't rely on me then. You're on your own, okay? That's the baseline. But current landscape, let me tell you how it's going to work. Most of the people who are not, poor, or who are not rich enough do not have any resources. These are not the people who are going to be able to do much. I call a person who's poor in my plan who has no knowledge because they will be poor people regardless of whatever system you're ever going to run. You know, even if uh, Isab Nimarim is going to come here and uh, you're going to see the landscape, there will be the social, socio-economic hierarchical dispositions, you know, and classifications. And well, that is what Allah is saying that, you know, some people will be tested with poverty, some people will not. Some people will be tested with money. Yeah. So I'm not talking about the individual. I'm talking about, you know, the whole group moving together. We need the poor people. We need the rich people because we don't really look at them from this perspective. But we should judge the people who do not have knowledge because it does not require money to read the Quran and understand it. If anything, all the most of the prophets never had money. And uh, their followers were mainly poor. Yeah, most of the followers. Most of the followers, followers were poor. Most of the followers they didn't have a resource. Mm -hmm. Some of the people with resource were appreciated so that we need them, okay? But that was not up to them to become resourceful. Otherwise, everyone would be resor uh, resourceful. Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ibn Affan, yeah, Abdurrahman and, and, bin Auf. Uh, Abdur bin Auf, and, yeah. and uh, there's so many, but not so many, but you know, but they're enough so that we can understand that, yeah, you know what, resource is required. When Uthman uh, bin Affan gave, you know, in Ghazwat Tabuk, first draft, second draft of gold. Kind of Prophet said, you know what? Uthman can do whatever now, you know? <laughs> You're free of anything. I mean, this is, uh, imagine, imagine the, the, these on, you know, if we were to be said to any other human being, you know, from now, from here on, Uthman can do whatever. So, yeah. it is appreciated. Why do law masatatum in kuwa kuwa means politics. Politics requires money. Even Jannah said, you know, give me some bullets of silver and I'm going to win you this war. I mean, we know, we, that's what I'm saying. We need Muslim youth to come into power in terms of awesome careers, big company, good jobs, politically well-placed jobs, and making sure that they're respected in their fields as well. And whoever is respected in this field, naturally is going to get money. However, the general mass in... Uh, uh, you know, in, in Muslim remote world. areas in Pakistan or, 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 or you know, in, in, in Bangladesh. Those are the people dependent on those metro youths who actually were responsible for those remote, you know, placed poor people.
but they don't even realize that, you know, they're responsible. People in Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi, or Dhaka, or Chittagong, or whatever is a big city, I don't, I don't. No, you mentioned all the big ones. Yeah. Those boys and girls are responsible for those remote people's resources. They just don't know it yet. That's what I'm saying. We need to make them responsible. If I know I'm responsible for 20,000 people, I'm naturally going to be, you know, studying for it, learning for it, mm -hmm. even first of all, yearning for it. And then I'm gonna learn for it. And then become competent enough to actually do something about it. But we're not letting them think on these lines because we've changed the definition of a Muslim, that you do your own taskiyah and that's it. You, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. This is not Islam. This is Akhirah. Islam in this planet is Anfusana. Anfusana, all of us together. And this is why. I'm not talking about just Chittagong and Chittagong, Chittagong youth. I'm talking about the Lahori and Karachi youth responsible for remote areas in your Bangladesh. Because we are still in the same family. And unless we do that sort of a connection and network, this is not going to work. My plan only works when everybody comes together. Enough people. I'm not saying every literal person. Enough people from every place come together as a network. It's, we, you know, we call it the TDP now. I actually am officially calling it the Teenage Development Program. Mm -hmm. From Melbourne to, you know, Houston to London to Manchester, where are the big cities are, all the teenagers are supposed to be getting at least eight skills to come up to, uh, to, you know, to, to gain points in these four pillars measurably. Mm -hmm. And their pillars better be visible globally because if it's not global it's not you know it's not political and if it's not global it's not going to have that financial independence because if i have two hundred thousand people in my network literally with the same purpose i, I can launch a product and it's, i'm going to be a millionaire you know what I'm saying but it's not going to be you know a commercial plan i'm just going to have to establish this so that our kids when they speak in any conference in California or Melbourne or London, everyone in the world would know, you know how competent this boy is. He's done his homework. He's not just aware of what the global policy is or public policy is. He is going to make sure, you know, right resources are triggered to make that change. This is how any politician works in Geneva, from, you know, in, in, in Paris or in, in Washington. They, you know, the, these people are doing the right thing in the right place, not for the right reasons. We have the right reasons, which is called Islam. How many more cities you got left as part of your tour? Oh, I just began. I have uh, six more. I'm going to do one more in London and uh, Newcastle, yep. uh, Birmingham, Manchester, Bradford, and uh, uh, Southampton. And uh, there's a talk in uh, Nottingham I have to, to do the London School of Economics again they just mm -hmm. called me again for another session so this is first draft England then I have to go to Oslo and uh, Sweden and probably Copenhagen because uh, that's practically where you know my family is so it's uh, after that I'm done with the European thing and when would you see us again? Uh, I just call, got a call from Birmingham that, you know, this is not going to work. We cannot just, because this one session is not going to be enough. Birmingham is literally Pakistan. You, you know what he <laughs> says? He says, you're not going to find a Gora here. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> not in small heat or Alam, Alam Rock, anywhere like that. Yeah, no. I did not know that. So, so I, I'll have to do a plan, a, a return, uh, a sequel uh, with a totally different uh, spin because I need to give some tasks, connect them and come back and follow up whether these kids are... Or parents, because I give tasks to parents and, mm. uh, you know, uh, youth different tasks. And I haven't done any youth program yet. I went to Australia for, you know, two different kind of programs, for, for the general mass one, particularly for the youth. Here, I haven't really come up with a youth program because it was a 30-day schedule and still every day was packed. I have to come back for, for parenting and youth programming, uh, inshallah. But uh, I need to cover you know, back home, Toronto, I need to go to America. There are 27 booked sessions in America, which I left for the last, because I need to cover all of this. Once all of them are together, you know, you have yourself your, your first draft network. But these will be parents. Very busy. Oh, inshallah. No, this is just the beginning. If, you know, God willing, if I am going to live that long, uh, I'm going to keep following it up so that, you know, someone is going to take up the next tour. I don't have to come if I'm doing the whole tour all over again, then, you know, it's not working. You know, I need to get a, a boys and girls to come in and, you know, take the baton. Well, for selfish reasons, I would want you to visit again so we can host you again. Oh, inshallah. No, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, inshallah. of course. Yeah, yeah. and I need uh, you specifically. <laughs> you have no idea how, how, how much of a, you know, use I have for people in your position. Because you are in a position of power. See, now this is something which is responsibility. 
And this is something which is why you become so alluring because this podcast alone in 20 sessions, you know, you can't even measure the weight of this. Of you know, this is this is how big of responsibility this is. So we have to be really careful in choosing our words so that you know you can trigger the right. Because you know it's it's your neurons in your head that are the strings. You're the puppeteer of the next generation. You're literally puppeteering how the next generation is going to move. This is the power of the. You're telling everyone our secrets, Sahil Bhai. Oh God, silly. Inshallah. But seriously. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So this is, if you imagine if Islam is, you know, pouring through your neurons into the next generation, this is literally what the microphone of is course, doing. Of course, Inshallah. Is. So this is how, how I think uh, uh, of all of this landscape. This is how, uh, you know, these people of this stature become so important. Inshallah, may Allah take Amen. the real task. Amen. Uh, may Allah use us for his, you know, of the bigger purpose of Islam, inshallah, and our kids. Amen. And uh, this is the job. This is the job. This is the only job. <laughs> Everything else is secondary. Sayyid Bhai, Jazakallah khairan for your time. Oh, it, it was an honor having you on. Oh, are you kidding me? The honor is all mine. Thank you so much for having me. It's no, no, such a pleasure. Amen. May Allah bless you and preserve you, my dear brother. <laughs> Brothers and sisters and friends, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. A lot to unpick, a lot to think about, a lot to ponder on as youth and as parents. If you like this episode, do remember to click subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. And you can find all three seasons, including this episode, on all the major audio platforms. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.